Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. Hey, Bitch Talkers. We have a special guest on our show. Her name's Isabel Castro. She's the director of the documentary film Miha. And we're so happy to welcome her here to Bitch Talk. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. If you can do us a favor, can you explain to our audience what Miha is? So Miha is a documentary film. Um, it tells a story of two young Latinas uh, who are daughters of immigrants who are kind of pursuing their dreams in the music industry while also kind of navigating the pressures at home. Yeah, I want to dive into your casting because obviously it's centered around Doris mm. and her story and what comes of it. and. Um, how did you come across Doris? And did you know when you picked her that she had just this gold mine of fa family videos? Because it really makes such a difference in the film. Um, I met Doris. So I read an article about uh, Kuko, um, a musician she used to manage. And I, I just fell in love with his music. I just really was moved by what he represented um, for me and in the music industry. And so I reached out to her and I think I just, in conversation with her, I just, I really got a sense that this woman was extremely ambitious and driven. And I was like, kind of like mesmerized by her <laughs> energy. Um, she's mm -hmm. just like a really big energy. And, um, and so we, she invited me out, you know, after months of kind of talking here and there, she invited me out to a concert that she had organized in New York. And, um, I showed up and then like kind of, you know, I think the moment I really realized I wanted to make this film was when I was like in the crowd of that concert, like, which is in the film, but you're just like surrounded by like an ocean of like brown kids who are like singing in Spanish. And I was just really moved by it. Um, and I saw Doris who is like kind of behind the scenes, like responding to phone calls and texts and just like kind of like a mastermind behind a lot of this. Um, and so I, I just, I asked her at that concert if she was interested and she said yes. Um, and so um, that's how, that's how the, you know, how, that's how I decided to work with her. That's how the, that, you know, that uh, relationship started. Um, I had no idea that there was going to be such an incredible treasure trove of, of uh, family home videos. I like, <laughs> I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I the so the father Doris's father actually went to school for broadcast journalism, and so he like just filmed everything, and he like has this like newscaster voice. And <laughs> at some point, you know, and I do this with all of my documentaries. I just ask like, "Hey, do you have any archive? Do you have any like family videos or photos?" And they like pull out this box, and it's just like <laughs> tapes upon tapes, and so we got them all digitized and it was just, yeah. I mean, it was like pure gold, but I know no idea going into it that that was there. Yeah. I love those VHS tapes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nostalgic. I love it. Yeah. Um, I, I was reading your bio and I, I want to quote it. Um, so I don't get it incorrect, but um, your style combines practice and journalism and art to tell stories. And I want to know, do you have a background in journalism? And how does it, if you do, how does it help um, you develop your filmmaking? So I, um, I wanted to be a photojournalist for a very long time. I went to school for journalism and photography. I took that very literally. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, I, I, I went to school for journalism and I think, you know, the first documentary I ever made was a documentary about transgender immigrants seeking political asylum in the United States. Um, I've always just been like really kind of obsessed with understanding immigration policy and the ways that 
Uh, it's just like, I mean, even immigration lawyers talk about how endlessly confusing and complex it is. And so for me, it's always just been kind of this thing that I've always like had a lot of curiosity about trying to understand. Um, so basically, um, I think I think what led me to journalism. So I make this first film about called Crossing Over, um, fall in love with making documentaries, but ultimately was like to totally terrified of the prospect of like forging a career in independent film. Independent film is just like extraordinarily unstable and like mm -hmm. difficult to finance and difficult to navigate. And so um, after the exp my experience of making my first film, I was like, okay, I love this. I love doing this, but I would like to try to figure out like a more pragmatic way of trying to navigate or like applying these skills. So I went back to kind of, it wasn't photojournalism anymore, but it, I went back to journalism in that um, I became like a broadcast producer. So I was working at Vice on mm -hmm. HBO. Um, I worked at Vice on HBO for three years. Um, a little show called Vice on HBO. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Carry Never on. Heard of it. <laughs> you just throw it out there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I actually, I mean, I was like, so, I mean, it really, uh, I, I was just so stuck. Like, I like love this profession. And I was like, how can I continue doing this? And at the time there were like bikes on HBO, like posters on the subway. And I was like, oh my God, like I could work somewhere like there. And I emailed them and they're like, we're not hiring. And then I like emailed them over the course of like, I don't know, a year, like incessantly. Nice. Um, and then finally I got like an interview and I started working there. Um, uh about like two years after graduating from college or yeah two or three years and so um anyways i worked at vice i uh as a producer a lot of journalism in that um and then i left um i left about five or six years ago um because i just i was like okay i feel like i've cut my teeth doing this i feel a bit more confident in my ability to turn things around um and I left Vice and then just started freelancing. So I freelanced for the New York Times. I freelanced for the Marshall Project. Mm -hmm. And again, I was always like, I've never worked in commercial spaces. Like I've always just tried to work, be like pretty, pretty like committed to like journalism and like different space, you know, different medium outlets that were journalistic. Anyway, long story short, I think what I, I think that as much as I love journalism and I think it's like in incredibly crucial um i became a little bit disillusioned by this kind of uh the aspiration towards objectivity and so this film mm -hmm. is kind of a reaction to that like i wanted this film to feel like it had a very clear point of view um i think there are many aspects of my journalistic journalism background that kind of informed my practice and my process but i was a little bit more um I, you know, there are a lot of things that I did in Niha that I wouldn't do in a normal in in journalism per se. Like there are a couple of scenes that are recreations. Um, the visuals, mm -hmm. you know, the visuals of the film are very, very intentionally subjective. Um, but I do think that like the the my journalistic background is what like led me to the story in the first place. And also like um, as a as a broadcast producer, like when stories change course, like you just have to react to it. And I think that's what happened in this film too. And I think that my background in journalism kind of prepared me to be able to manage it. Thank you for explaining that because we have a lot of women on our show that are documentary filmmakers, but yeah. their backgrounds in journalism. Yeah. And I don't know if we see that a lot with men. So I think it's, it's an interesting maneuver ah, for yeah. women. I'm glad you, you did talk about that because I wanted to get into Doris's VOs. Mm -hmm. um, they're very impactful and emotional. And I was just curious, your process, were you interviewing her throughout or did you record it later once you knew how the story was going to be told? Because it's it's very impactful. Ooh, the VO, I mean, the VO was the biggest labor of love in this film. Um, I think, you know, it's funny coming off of the last question, like my experience in broadcast television really prepared me for writing you know helping write this video um in many ways like i i think i went into this film knowing i wanted to do vo 
partially because stylistically it really made sense to me um just in terms of its kind of ability to like you know i i, I reference like clueless or sex in the city as comps like you really kind of mm. feel a connection to the protagonist even if you have nothing in common with them because a vo kind of gives you insight into their headspace and so i knew i wanted to do vo um but furthermore like having come from a place like vice vice on hbo like i kind of had a process that i'd been through many times in order to do that um so it felt kind of like a familiar thing that i might be able to try to figure out so the way that the process worked is that like so i interviewed doris throughout the making of the film i conducted i think three interviews um or and just like a handful of like on the fly interviews i knew i would never include them well i wanted to never include them but in documentary, like, I just wanted to have them in case I needed them. Um, and there's actually, there's like, there's actually, there's, there's one interview where I'm in the car with Doris and she's driving that I just had to include. Um, and it kind of breaks the style of the film because otherwise you don't really have interviews in the film. But like her emotions in that moment felt so raw that like I knew I wasn't going to be able to replicate that. But like that scene, I have many. Um, so, you know, we transcribed all of those interviews. And then what I did was very similar to kind of my process as a producer at Vice on HBO, which is that, you know, we structured the film um, and then had temporary temp and temp VO, VO, temporary voiceover kind of plugged in at the different sections that I knew that we were going to need them. Um, and then I like wrote basically the sentiments that I wanted in each of those sections. So like there's a moment um, where it's kind of like we're transitioning from Jack's story back to Doris's and we see Jack's on the roof of her car with Raul. And then it transitions into um, Doris with her family and like footage of her family kind of together. And I knew I wanted that moment to kind of like talk about the these kind of intergenerational pressures that we carry with ourselves so like i would write the temporary bio about how i wanted it to be about like the weight that we carry um and then so then you know you're left with like basically like i don't know how many vo lines we had I, I think we had like 30 to 40 vo sections and so then each of those vo sections i basically took both the transcripts and took the um, Instagram, I, I took Instagram posts because Doris writes very long Instagram posts that are like in her language. And I also took, she lent me a bunch of her diaries. So I um, wow. <laughs> kind of imposed, because I wanted all of these, you know, all of these sections to really feel like they were in her language. And then we had kind of, that's where the process started. So then we brought in um, we brought in two writers, Walter Thompson Hernandez and Jessica Salgado, um, and basically had like a writer's room of sorts. Like I would show them. I didn't want to show Doris the film until it was finished. Um, and so I would just show sections. So I would show the sections that the VO was a part of and I would play it. And sometimes like the VO would just be my voice. I would do temporary voiceover and then it would be plugged in and I'd show it. And then we'd sit down and kind of workshop those sections together. And so it kind of incorporated language from Jessica, from Walter, and they both like really kind of helped Doris like get closer to kind of her emotional truth because I think she like, in some ways, all of these sessions almost felt like therapy. Like we were like talking through <laughs> like what each of these sections meant. Um, and we went through this process. I mean, we must have had, um, I, I I should count them. I think over like 20 to 30 voiceover sessions, we would go wow. in a booth. Um, and then sometimes we would have written it and, you know, Doris would be there and she'd want to kind of, you know, do it somehow differently. Um, the delivery of it was also kind of really um, sometimes challenging because we needed to strike the right tone. And so in some ways, like it almost felt like acting in moments because it'd be like, OK, Doris, like you need to communicate in this way that feels like very like Solomon. Like there were days where she was very, you know, going through stuff and felt really sad and we needed to say something that was really happy. Anyway, it was like an ongoing. Uh, it was like it was really a labor of love to finally get it to a point where 
we felt like the tone was just right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think in some ways it was one of the most challenging parts of the film. It was definitely mo one of the most creatively challenging. It works. It was worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It, totally <laughs> it kind of feels works. a little bit like an audiobook at times, like, oh, the kind of soothing and yeah. storytelling. Yes. Yeah, so anyway, thank you. The process was worth it. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about funding for a project like this. Yeah. Uh, and also trying to fund it through a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. And and also how did Disney get involved? Yes. Um, I mean, so for me and both of the producers, I mean, this was our first feature film um, and it was a boot camp in terms of <laughs> figuring out how to finance it. Um, the film started under the, uh, I had I have a fel had a fellowship with Concordia Studio um, and they basically gave me a grant to try to figure out what my project, you know, I, I what project I wanted to make. Um, and I'm like, you know, extraordinarily thankful to them because getting kind of development financing is really, I think, one of the most the challenging parts um, mm -hmm. of the financing kind of uh, financing process. Like the first money in is always like one of the most challenging things to get. So I was got really, really lucky because I had this fellowship at Concordia. Um, we basically developed a reel developed the idea and then we took it out we took it out to um so we uh got develop additional development financing from Cinereach and impact partners um and then we um then we kind of at that point you know had enough financing to get us through a lot of production like our production was really lean because i shoot um, and so I was shooting a lot alone or with a really small crew or just with um, Yesenia, one of the producers on the film. Um, um, and then once we started to get more financing, the crew kind of continued to grow. But at least initially, like so much of the fi the financing went really far because it was just me with my camera a lot of the mm -hmm. time. And that was really intentional. I think like when I made my first film or when I've made films when I made my first film, one of the biggest challenges was that I didn't shoot. So like, um, and I, I feel very strongly about paying people that I work with. And so I like was just going crazy trying to cobble together enough money to like put together another shoot or put together another edit. And so when I quit Vice, I like, I was like, I'm going to learn how to shoot so that I can keep the overhead really low. So um, that funding from Concordia, Cinereach, and Impact really got us through a lot of uh, production. And then we just applied to every grant we could possibly find <laughs> um, and were was able to get um, grants, grant financing from, I, and I don't, I, I feel like I'm going to leave somebody out, but we got so, we got so much incredible support, you know, from Chicken and Egg, Firelight. Yeah. NBC Studios and points uh, all points north um catapult fund um uh shoot I feel like I'm gonna forget someone but anyway um so it's the soft financing part so soft financing financing is related to kind of grants so the other financing that I talked about through center region impact that was equity financing all of these grants we kind of got as just grants money that we didn't have to uh pay back um and and yeah, and and we got really lucky and we were able to fully finance a film through all of these different sources. But, you know, I talk, you know, the job of financing a film is almost just as much or more than actually making it. Mm -hmm. um, it is a full time job. Um, in the pandemic, it was really scary because the film that we had a niche initially pitched or the kind of the the film that we had initially thought we were going to make was no longer possible. Like we could mm. not go to concerts. Uh, we could not go on tour. It was really unclear what the story was going to be. And I think there was a lot of doubt, even from the financiers we had, like, okay, what's the story now? Um, and I think that we just like remained really resolute in the ideas and themes of the film and a belief that, you know, the a story was going to shape around that. Um, and I think once we got the scene of Doris's family's reunification with her family and of the 
you know, the green card scene where they were mm-hmm. seeing cards, I think that we were able to kind of explain a lot more clearly to folks that there was a film here and that like, even though it wasn't the film that we sought out to make, like there was going to be a way that we were going to make this work because we had such powerful scenes already in the can. Um, and we shot those scenes during the height of the pandemic, um, which was really scary. Like mm-hmm. we were testing, I mean, we were testing, I don't know, like hundreds of times and uh, working with a really, really small crew who would test before where N95, like we just were trying to be as safe as possible, but production didn't really fully stop because a lot of these, the story was unfolding in real time and Mm -hmm. the family was still, you know, wanting to go to Mexico to see their family. Um, And so, um, so that's how uh, the financing came together. Um, In terms of Disney, like we got a sales agent, Synetic. Um, So once we got into Sundance, kind of uh, Synetic had conversations with various distributors and um, we chose Disney because it just like, I mean, Disney wasn't even in our periphery, if I'm going to be 100%. Right. Honest. Yeah. Like, I just like <laughs> hadn't even considered it an option because uh, we don't have a long history of like acquiring documentaries. Um, right. And so, um, but they did. And it just, you know, I think that the execs over there, a lot of them just like really personally relate to the film. Um, and I just, I heard that in the conversations that we were having. And besides that like it's just the disney brand is like so in line like the fact that this story that is so emotionally resonant to me and to doris and to jacks is going to reach such a huge audience i mean it was it was beyond our wildest dreams but uh the way that it came together i mean they just basically approached us after seeing it at sundance and then our uh sales agents took care of (laughs) it work that's fantastic in in such a inspiring story um and also you need a vacation isabel yeah (laughs) hoping you take a couple days anyway can you please put your feet up somewhere (laughs) like a hot tub or something um thank you so much for your time we have to wrap this this film is beautiful we're so happy it's going to have a big platform the film is miha we've been speaking with director isabel castro and come back to bitch talk we'd love to see you again awesome this is really fun thank you If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.